Welcome to the Art and Science of Complex Sales. This is the Leadership Quarter. This is a podcast for revenue, sales, and go-to-market leaders and practitioners that is focused on bringing you insights from the best and brightest the world has to offer. The Leadership Quarter is focused on asking the critical questions. How do we develop and empower sales leaders to build strong cultures and teams to hit our growth goals? Experts from around the world give their experiences and opinions on this critical aspect of sales. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow on your favorite podcast platform. And let's dive in to introducing today's guests. This week, we're heading back down under to talk sales. A connector and entrepreneur, Mike Stokes, has made developing sales communities and leaders his business. His love for sales started with a purchase of a laminating and mounting business with his sister, and after blood, sweat, and increased sales, they were able to exit that building successfully, and Mike started down his career in helping build sales leaders across industries. He's brought together top sales leaders into community and dives deep with them on solving the issues they're facing. Mike goes into his journey today, the critical aspects of sales leadership, the coming surge of AI, and the top things we can do to develop ourselves as leader. Let's get started with Mike Stokes. Mike Stokes, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you, Paul. Doing very well. Well, welcome to the program. I'm really excited to have you on today. I got to say, the first time that I really saw your work is that mood mood impact report that you all did down in uh, cool. uh, Down Under. That is fantastic stuff. Yeah, well, it's been a seven-year journey that uh, it's called the mood of the sales leader, and it's been a seven-year journey to um, which has been awesome for us. You know, the the insights we're able to to extract out of out of out of the mood has just been fantastic. Well, let's talk well, a little bit that. Let's let's save it for uh, we'll save it for a little sure. bit further in the program. Let's talk about it. But I have to ask you once we get started. Everybody that comes on the program generally has to define one thing. And that is, we're talking about sales. What is sales to Mike Stokes of Indicator? Yeah, I saw that question. That's a pretty challenging question, actually. So, uh, okay, here's my here's my take on it. Sales is a service offered to customers and potential customers to help guide them in the right direction when they're looking to buy products or services that can add value or take pain away from the from from them or their business. And if you do sales well, customers will want to work with you. They want to come back and continue to work with you. It'll help set up a, a great relationship going forward, and hopefully they'll refer to you, and you'll be able to do sales at scale. Let me dive into one one word on that I picked up. That is a unique word that I haven't heard across any other definition. But you said sales is a service. Tell me a little bit. Tell me a little bit uh, more about that. Like, how would you define it as a? We usually think of services being paid for, right? Bought and paid for, but this is yeah. Well, it, it's, it's, you know, certainly for me, it's something you do for companies as mm-hmm. opposed to, you know, I've heard others saying, you know, you do to them, but sales is something you do, you do for them. It is, a, it is a value add. It is, if you're good at it, you're going to help customers solve problems and issues. And so for me, it is a service. It is a service. And sometimes it's an unpaid service. But sometimes it leads to, to being paid. So, but it is something that adds value to to customers or potential customers. So, do f- do for customers and adds value are two very critical parts of that definition. Not do to customers. Hundred percent. Yeah. 100%. I'm going to skip. And it's, for me, sorry. Well, for me, oh, no, sales is all about adding value and, and or taking pain away. You know. So, what I call them vitamins and paracetamols. So, vitamins is when you're adding value and paracetamols when you're removing pain. Vitamins and what was the second word there? Paracetamols. I don't know if that's an expression you use in the US, but it's uh, no. It's uh, what? What are you? Uh, aspirin? Do you use aspirin? Okay. As- yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So vitamins and par and we have to we have to mention you are uh, you're down under you're and New Zealand, and how did you get started in sales in New Zealand? So, actually, I, I never thought that I was going to be in sales in a in a relatively, you know, in my teenage years, because I felt like many of us that sales was for the extroverted, the the gift of the gab type person. But in some ways, looking back on it during high school, actually, I was probably always destined for sales. But I had I had a couple of sales roles after university in my early twenties, but then. Uh, 
I became really serious and interested uh, in sales when I ended up owning a business in my mid twenties, and I recognised then that sales was critical to this business. And if we didn't have good sales, then we wouldn't be able to pay the wages. We wouldn't be able to pay our own wages, you know, mortgages, you know, keep the business alive. And so that's when I really started going deep in terms of understanding about sales, reading the Zig Ziglar's and the Brian Tracy's and and even the Donald Trumps of the world. I remember getting as much literature as I could to be, you know, to, to make this company successful. So you read The Art of the Deal? <laughs> read The Art of the Deal. I can't remember it's learning great. too much from it. It's not to say I didn't. Oh, but God. I, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. But I, I, did, I did love Zig Ziglar. I love Zig Ziglar. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Zig, I remember I used to drive, um, I was in my dad's car. He had this old Oldsmobile. Well, at the time it was a, a really nice, it was a company car. They had given it to him and he, every morning uh, on my way to school, he would listen to Zig Ziglar. And really on the way, he had this big book of cassettes. So I made, Zig was my, was my companion, Tony Bennett, when my mom was driving and Zig, when, uh, when my dad was driving, but, uh, but yeah, it was really, it was really cool. So I got, I got an early education on Zig Ziglar. So you said when you started a business, what type of business did you, we did you start when you're 20s? Well, we didn't actually start it. We, okay. we, actually, we I, I bought it with my sister, which was oh, wow. ironic at the time because if you'd ever said to either of us that we're going to be in business together, we would have laughed at that. But I'd come back from overseas and uh, there was an opportunity. And so we bought this business and it was a mounting and laminating company. So in those days, printed material would be, you know, would be printed and then we would mount and potentially laminate various uh, mm-hmm. substrates to go into, you know, offices, car companies, music businesses, malls, that type of thing. Anywhere where you would see uh, large scale imagery was typically mounted as opposed to, to framed. And uh, it was yeah, certainly, it was really a business we just fell into. And it had been around for 20 years and, and with a good sales focus you know we managed to triple the size of it in seven years and we successfully sold it and so that was really my first understanding of just how important sales is that's that's, that's fascinating that's you we've yeah. talked about zig ziglar and we now we've talked uh, yeah. my parents i i came into a uh, uh i was in a print a print business for a long time when my parents were growing up with my parents when i was growing up so and then in college that was the choice to buy into the family business with my sister of all things or uh, wow. or move on and I actually didn't I actually didn't buy into the family wow. business but I ended up running a business with my sister like uh, 10 years after that um, but yeah, yeah but laminating was laminating I didn't do it on the scale you did but man I put a lot of a lot of sheets through that laminator yeah funny well we had we did a, a big part of the business was actually photographic exhibitions as well and I think that's where most of my gray hairs came from dealing with photographers and how particular they are. And if you got a speck of dust under a, an image going onto a board, it would stick out in a pimple. And it was, you know, so, so I had a lot of stress with that. But it was a great little business. And, um, and we managed to, um, you know, grow it successfully and sell it. So, yeah, it was, as I say, it was my first real understanding of just how important sales was. So did you go from that directly into Indicator? Or where 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 did the journey take you after no. that? I then worked for a, a business growth organization, which worked with uh, startups and established companies. And I worked with them for seven years. It was a, a fantastic business. It was well respected both in New Zealand and internationally. And one of that is really my realization that from there is how many companies struggled with selling. And, you know, I can, can't tell you how many startup meetings I sat in. The founder would put up this hockey stick of revenue on a screen and um say look we we just need four percent or five percent of the market and and this is the revenue we'll achieve but when you ask them actually how they're going to achieve this there was you know very little idea about how they were going to do it um and then also working with established companies who who really hadn't didn't have the the basic structure in place to grow a successful team despite in many cases being a really successful and and um in good business. So that was really the the eye opening of what a great opportunity it was to to enhance the performance from from uh, from businesses in their sales approach. 
Wow. So you take it, you go through that and then that is your leap then. So seven years there, seven years in your own, seven years in, and as a part of a company, and then you leap into back into entrepreneurship. Yeah. Well, so at the end of that, end of the end of my time, the had seven year itch to do something else. We noted that there was, you know, a really big opportunity to improve performance of, of, of companies and with an individual a contact of mine, not a strong contact at that point. We didn't know each other that well. He had sold a, a, a large business in the US and come back to live in New Zealand. And we decided that, you know, sales and particular sales leadership was to, so critical to, to businesses. And, and we went out and we interviewed 50 sales leaders and we asked them what were their challenges and their issues were going through. And we were sort of flabbergasted that, Virtually none of them had had any sales leadership development. Virtually none of them, which was quite incredible. Quite a few of them had leadership, but not sales leadership specific. And so we started a particular product, which is very much alive today, which was our first product, which is a peer-to-peer learning and development program for sales leaders. And the really the premise of that was providing the opportunity for sales leaders to learn off each other and also experts that we would bring in. And it proved to be you know, really successful. And that was really the, the launching pad for, for Indicator. Yeah. Was that the biggest gap that you saw in sales was the ability to lead and execute on plans? 100%. Um, 100%. Yeah. Still is. It still is. You know, sales leadership is, is the most critical element of, of any, of any, you know, sales business. And it is still a, uh, there's still many, many gaps in that sales leadership space. You know, you lift the capability of that sales leader, you lift the whole team. So that was the area that we focused on and still focused on. And, you know, a big part of it was was for sales leaders. None of us went to university to study how to be a sales leader. And the, typically the issues, as we know, Paul, is we still very much see it happening now as the best salesperson gets put into the best, you know, into the sales leadership role. And quite often the best salesperson is, is not suited for the best sales leader, you know, is for the sales leader role. So we still see those problems very much today. I think it's better, but it's still still an issue. Well, let's talk about what that gap, what you see that gap is. Like, are there specific uh, specific traits and skills that you see that most of the time that you need to hop in, or is it a, a you know just a variety of, across the board when you're looking at sales leadership? It's it really is a variety. Starting off, sales leaders may you know they quite often they don't necessarily have the support of a leader meaning that the leader they report into quite often is not from a sales leadership background and you have the challenges as we know as sales people by their very nature aren't necessarily the easiest easiest people to manage sales by itself is not you know it's not a linear it's not a linear process um but i think there's an awareness of what a good sales leader what a good sales leader does is a first and most important element, you know. So for us, it's all about the people process and technology that, that sales leaders, leaders need to drive. And it starts off with, you know, with having a passion to, to, to improve and, and, and to support their team and to put in the structure and, and all of those key areas that make sales leadership, um, you know, challenging and, and exciting at the same time. So how do you start with an organization and um, when, you, when you're looking at uh, a sales leader, mm. you're saying, okay, let's start to build you and build your team. What are some of the critical aspects that you just start with at the beginning? It, it, it depends, I suppose, on, you know, are they playing a true sales leader role or sometimes you see, you know, varieties of that. Sometimes we still see sales leaders who have a sales target as well. But I think, you know, there's some great tools out there that can assess the the leadership, sales leadership capability of, of of sales leaders. But it's really a truly truly the understanding of, you know, what are they what have they got in place? What are they passionate about? What are they trying to achieve? And then what are the missing gaps? You know, really critical. Um, I think a lot can be solved with sales leadership and salespeople by passion and culture. I think you know, can, that's that's often the the starting point. You know, is the is the sales leader passionate about their role? Are they be, do they feel like they're being well supported? Um, are they passionate to make change? All of those things, which, you know, all those mindsets, which are so critical. And then you dive down into the sales team and, you know, in our research from the mood of the sales leader every year, it always highlights that 
the most important trait of a salesperson is inner drive. You know, it's that inner motivation or or, or drive to be successful. Um, and this also accounts for sales leaders as well. Inner drive can be manifested by a number of different areas. You know, it can be, you know, the individual itself, uh, obviously from a recruitment perspective, but it also can be that this person is excited to work for the business, that they love the products, the services, the brands. They love everything about the business. They feel well supported. They f- they're getting good development opportunities because that's typically what, if not the number one thing that, that salespeople want, it's the number two thing. And that their manager has got their back. Their manager is there to support them. And, um, you know, when I first became a sales leader, I thought I had to be best at everything. I thought I had to be the, the best at sales, the best at technology, the best at process, the best at everything. And really, really, I don't. I just need to be the best at lifting, lifting my team. That's a huge, huge thing. I'm going to go back to the how you started your business too, because it sounds like that community and that hunger for being around people of like mindedness that have that passion is is also something that is really critical uh, in developing that sales leadership. Being around those like minded people, yeah. Um, Because sometimes, as a sales leader, you do find yourself on an island. Trying to keep yourself pumped up, you know, mm-hmm. trying to keep yourself uh, uh, executing at a high level, so the team can therefore execute at a high level. Tell me a little bit about that, about being around those like-minded sales individuals, because that sounds absolutely like a, a huge win in creating a gathering like that. Yeah, well, I, I like the word that you've used, community, because actually the essence of our business is built around community, and it started with that program that I mentioned, but then is also you know, every event that we run, you know, is based on community and value of community and value of sales leaders or salespeople being together. Um, we were very passionate about, we started a woman in sales uh, events a number of years ago, and that's just been fantastic, you know, in terms of bringing people with great energy into a room and, and helping to to inspire them. The The mood of the sales leader actually came out of, um, out of karma, came out, of every month in that peer-to-peer development program, we would learn about what's happening in the marketplace. So these sales leaders, we would see all these sales leaders every month and they'd tell us, are they recruiting? Are they, you know, how are their sales going? What are their particular challenge? What are their issues? What are they going through at the moment? And it was incredible insight. So that's why we decided to put some formality around it. And, and look, I think there is, even if we provided them nothing at all but put sales leaders in a room together, then there is a huge amount of value, you know, and it's kind of like that. You can benchmark yourselves against the quality of your leadership versus others, but it's also that shared pain, you know, that shared pain that sales leadership is, is a tough gig, you know, it's a tough gig. You're only as good as your last quarter and, you know, you you might be reporting into a board or, or a manager or an owner and all they want is more, all they want is more revenue. They don't see the, all the additional work that goes into it. So, so the community element's huge. Absolutely huge. Yeah, and it's it's one of the things I find really interesting about that sales community is there's always somebody winning. Like if you have a if you have a community, there's generally going to be somebody winning, and that's really critical for that that community and that energy. Like I, I learned that when we had our I had the sales as a service business a long time ago, and it was nice because you would have you know forty reps, but they and Three would be working on one engagement. Six would be working on another. Three would be work. One engagement was always, you know, was always hitting numbers despite. And because you're not going to always be hitting. It, it's a myth that you're that every sales organization everywhere should is going to be hitting their numbers. Like we can always do better. But quite honestly, it, that's a that's a myth. But to see someone and have that connection and hope and tie that to tie that to people that are winning as well as losing. Uh, well, losing, you know, not not uh, winning the market right now. I think it's critical because you always need that uplift. Yeah, you always need that camaraderie of the, and it, that's hard to get when you're when you're facing a board or you're facing a an owner and you're you know you're at 80 percent of the number, right? And yeah. and you're doing your absolute best work. Um, yeah. yeah, sometimes that is the case, right? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's the it's the fascinating thing about sales. It comes back to that non linear piece. It's like being a, a, a what we would call a, a cricket batsman in New Zealand, or I imagine a, a baseball hitter, and 
you know, sometimes you, you just don't get them. You know, you don't get the wins and you're in a bit of a slump. And even though you're doing great work and you're putting in the practice and you're putting in the effort, you don't always get the victories. And so it is good to be around others that are seeing the victory. Sometimes it's quite good to have misery likes company as well when you're seeing others um, that are also maybe struggling yeah. with economy and things like that. But you've got to have those wins in sales. Otherwise, no, none of us would do it. None of us would do it. But um, you either have to have those or see others that have been successful. Nobody likes going out. I mean, when you have a quarter or two and nobody likes going out there and getting punched in the face repeatedly, you know, it's like yeah. you've got yeah. to get some wins too, which is great. Well, um, exactly. And I, and I do think too, there's, there's no such thing as the perfect salesperson. No such thing. You know, I think it's not hard to be good. I think it's, it's, it's challenging to be excellent and it's impossible to be perfect. That's great perspective. Um, I'm going to shift a little bit with us because I'd, I'd like to go to, we're talking about community and we're talking about culture, being able to build sales leaders. How do you think, and I saw you recently did a webinar on this. How do you think this, this phenomenon of, of AI that's invading, uh, it's just a, a part of the sales part of sales. Now, how do you think that is impacting leadership community and culture or is it yet? I think, I think we haven't yet seen how significant this is going to be. There's no doubt it's going to be significant. And we see the starting points, obviously, already. Um, it's interesting because we I played golf recently with a, with a lawyer and a pilot and a sales leader. And we had this debate about who was going to lose their job first to AI. And we all agreed that the lawyer would go first. None of us were too upset about that. Um, <laughs> And the pilot thought he had some time to run because no insurance company would want to insure a, a plane without a pilot. And then from a sales perspective, we felt that maybe we were a little bit sheltered, but we'd be foolish to be complacent about it. I think AI is, you know, there's that great line. I don't know who said it, but, you know, I think this is a short term, a short term quote really, is that AI is not going to replace humans. But humans using AI will replace humans that aren't using AI. And for me, AI just makes a salesperson superhuman. It reduces their admin significantly. I think we're all going to have sales, our own sales assistants doing a lot of our, you know, admin work, uh, if not now and certainly in the future. But it also enables us to, en en enables us to improve our customer experience and add more value to, to customers as well. It's going to be fascinating how it all rolls out. Absolutely fascinating. But I think there's either, you know, there's going to be two, two trains of thought, which are two, two schools. One is those who dive in and have got the early opportunities and those that, that wait. And I think for those that dive in and are using it to the, to the fullest, you know, they're going to have the competitive advantage. In, in our research in New Zealand, only 22% only of, of um, salespeople are actually using any AI tools. Slightly higher in Australia, I think about 30. Uh, US has always been further ahead of us in technology. And I think, you know, in many ways we haven't necessarily had to be on as focused on technology because of the size of our, of our market. You know, we're all about quality uh, versus quantity. But I, I don't think any of us can sit back and wait for it to come. Otherwise, it's just going to swamp us. But I think it's exciting. I think it's really exciting. And I, it's some of the tools that are coming off, just mind block, fascinating stuff. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how it evolves. So do you see it as a um, community enhancer? Or do you see it as something that could negatively impact the community? Looking at it from that part of your business, negatively impact the community of salespeople? Really good question. I've never thought about the community element of it. I don't think it will impact it uh, too much on the community aspect. It's it's kind of because, you know, human connection is so important in sales. And I would see AI as, as potentially as potentially adding value in, in different ways to community. But I think we're always going to have that element of community connection. So when, when COVID happened, all our sessions went online. Well, naturally, they all went online, and it added great value. You know, it added great value, and there was things that we kept kept out of it. But salespeople and sales leaders they crave that human connection as well. 
absolutely crave that human connection until we're all avatars you know we may be we may be still stuck with the human human to human for a while um but in in real reality i don't think anyone knows how much ai is going to impact everything over the next you know over the next 5 10 20 years it's definitely it's definitely going to have some significant changes and it's going to it's going to lose jobs in a variety of different spaces but it'll, it'll also it'll also provide those that are using it well that competitive advantage so i think it's really really exciting yeah i i get on the one hand i get super super excited about it like of, of all the possibilities and on the other hand i get almost uh I almost want to turn my nose up at it. <laughs> I said, if the computer could replace me, whatever, you know, it, it, I, I get that emotional reaction to it on, on both sides. And I, I have this analogy that I think, like, if you've ever been good at something, right, you're really like excellent at it. Uh, I'll just, I've been going to the gym recently. So there's always like the seven guys at the gym that have, that have been in there lifting for, the past, you know, 36 years and they're all huge. And, um, they have that tight knit group of like-minded people, right. That they can go and they can get next to each other and they could trade tips and tricks and all that stuff with AI. I actually think it's a very similar when you say that the, the near-term adopters, the people that get used to it sooner are going to be that tight knit group of people that have that expertise and that they do have a, a step up for the near term they're, they're figuring out how to use it they're figuring out how to use it to add community to add value to add become more human through the use of it um and not just replace themselves um i i think if we don't if we don't do that i'm with you like if we don't do that we're gonna have to <laughs> i don't think we have an alternative quite mm -hmm. frankly yeah you well, know um, and then most of these tools are quite easy to use too yeah, for I mean, the most it's not part. Written, you know, in this incredible code that you have to understand, it's plain English. So the, I think that probably the bigger um, the bigger thing is, you know, if you can almost dream it, what can you what can you do with it, and and which ones do you use, and which which ones do you don't, you know? So it's going to be pretty cool. I'm pretty excited about I'm pretty excited about it on the whole, but um, you know, we'll see we'll see what happens. But we're still in the, are we still in the agreement that B2B sales is still going to be a fundamentally human? Do you believe that B2B sales will be a fundamentally human interaction in the next five years? And I know I'm putting an answer, but nobody can answer that right now. <laughs> nobody, nobody can answer that. Nobody can yeah. answer that for sure. I think there is always going to be part of it will be the human, human to human interaction. And I don't think in the short term it's going to cause mass unemployment of, of roles to go, but it'll it'll definitely have an impact. And maybe the lower level salespeople, you know, their jobs are potentially more at risk than the higher level. But if you have some value to add, you know, if you have some problem solving ability and you have an opportunity to help customers, then then sales will always be around for that. And um, so I think our goal for, for, for all of us in sales is we've got to keep, we've got to keep two steps ahead of, of AI and we've got to keep two steps ahead of our customers so that we can continue to add, add value to them. And until AI can do really good humor and really good storytelling and so forth, then, then I think we'll be okay for a little bit longer. Yeah, I, 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 I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that it, it leads to a, a better. I love that quote you just said. Um, AI won't replace humans. Humans using AI will replace humans. Not. I, yeah. I think that's a great quote. Like, how do we how do we get it? I'm going to turn to something a little bit more practical now for the last couple of minutes of of the uh, the pod. Um, we've talked a lot about sales community. We've talked about a lot about developing sales leadership and the critical nature of sales leadership. Um, if you had you have five minutes left with me. Uh, and this audience, what are the what are the critical things? Let's say I want to become a sale, better sales leader. I want, I do. I want to. You know, I'm a sales leader. You can always improve. What are some critical aspects uh, that I should be looking at and reflecting on myself? What What are the things that I should be looking at? Okay, so I think for a sales leader, 
the worst kind of sales leader is a sales leader that's not wanting to do better, you know, that is not on that education journey. I met a, I met a sales leader last year. I remember this sits with me and the sales leader said to me, I feel like I know everything about sales leadership. And I just think that's such a wrong comment. So for a sales leader, they've got to be on that development journey. I mean, every single one, everything's changing constantly and we're going to be in a constant state of change for some time um, we were recently learning about from an anthropologist about the state that the world is that the world is that anthropologists have labeled this banny i don't know if you've heard of the, you heard of the expression banny paul no, no no so banny is highlights that a brittle anxious non-linear incomprehensible so brittle is that every business model is potentially at risk because of the way technology is changing, because of the way the world is moving, political, social, environmental challenges, da da da. Anxious is that obviously people are made really anxious by this non-linear, meaning that everything's moving and not straight lines and incomprehensible as things are happening in the world that you just cannot believe. And so we are in a constant state of that, whichever role you're in. So you've got to constantly be learning and developing to look to change. Uh, change things all the time. I just don't think any business now can sit still and expect um, the same or even better results than they've achieved. So, so that's one of the things that sales leaders in my mind have to be change experts. So they've got to be on that development journey. They've got to be change experts. They've got to really understand what excites and motivates their team, without a doubt. All of us are motivated by different things. We all get excited about different things. For me, what I think drove me as a as a salesperson was a fear of failure. It, that was what it, for me was all about. I hate the thought of, of of failure, so I just drove. That was what motivated motivated me to get through. Too often, companies have felt that that salespeople were just solely motivated by incentives. Don't get me wrong; all of us like getting paid, you know, incentives and and so forth. But the majority of sales people are not made of it, not motivated solely by money. They're normally motivated by being the best at, at what they are or being part of a phenomenal team or being part of a journey or having development opportunities or a whole range of things. And quite often money is down the line. There's a great little trick you can do where if you're with a, uh, a sale, you know, one of your sales team, just ask them what drives them, what motivates them and keep asking them until you've literally got a list of a dozen things and then ask them to rank, rank, what motivates them the, mo the most out of these 12. And normally it's the ones that you're getting to are 8, 9, 10, 11 down the list, which are actually the real ones. So I think that's the first thing as to what excites and motivates, you know, salespeople is critical. And you've got to have, and you've got to have their, uh, you know, their back. The other, the other parts, of course, is that, they, you know, the reality is that most sales leaders need to be structured. You know, they need to be fascinated by results and, and not just sales numbers, but all the, the leading indicators that go into sales. So they've got to have that, that quantitative and qualitative aspect as well, which is so, you know, which is so critical. And sadly, I mean, most of us aren't really excited about process, but it's vital for, for companies. And, and then now, of course, we've been thrust into, needing to be technology experts in a way. So it's a really it's a really challenging role. And I think most companies don't recognize how important that sales leadership role is. My encouragement is to every company is to get the best sales leader you can afford. Absolutely the best sales leader you can afford because they said everything. They said everything. And you know, and these sales leaders either either need to take the team that they that they get handed to or build a team. And that's when you go into things like recruitment. I mean, in our research, you know, you know, most uh, sales leaders will recognize that that they get recruitment only right, you know, most of the time and, and about thirty percent get it get it wrong, you know, half of the time. So, you know, it's it's a really challenging role. I think also also sales leaders, what sales leaders have to be good at these days is saying no as well. I mean, how many meetings do you get called into internal meetings for a lot of companies that have really little or no relevance for sales leaders? You know, they've got to be left to do to do their number one job. And um, so I think having the ability to say no is, is, um, is important as well. Um, but it also, you know, 
also understand your own strengths as well. You don't have to follow anyone else's leadership style, you know, but you have to have your own and be clear about what your own leadership style is and what you're aiming to achieve. I think I could keep going on, Paul, but I'd probably bore the listeners. Well, no, I'm actually, I'm going to actually take that back. I've been sitting here making a, a list of this. I really, I'm super appreciative of you running through all that. I'm just going to read it back to you, see if I got it right, which is, and I have to ask, uh, do you know the anthropologists think people would be uh, really appreciative that, that did the Bani, B-A-N-I? That's... Well, I'm not sure who created it. We were shared, okay. we were shared it um, locally by a guy by the name Michael Henderson, but I believe if you, if you Google it, you will find it because okay. it's, it's, a, it's, common, it's a common term in, uh, with anthropologists. But uh, it's the state of, state of the world as we, as we are at the moment in the days of companies just turning up and delivering the same product or service every year and thinking they're going to get the same results is, is crazy. So we're in a banny world. I yeah. love this. I just uh, we're in a banny world uh, yeah. because of that. A sales leader's role and has has shifted. We have to. It shifted more radically to this continual improvement, continual learning, is what I heard you say. And we need to do it in a way that you know we're we understand uh, our own motivations. So we're coming from that, but we're we're finding out what excites us and driving into that. A part of what we have to do is be structured. I literally have to be structured and have a process for for doing that as well as our uh, continuing education. Because if we're not, we're not doing it. That's generally what happens. And that we have to understand how to say no to the things that are getting in our way. Yeah. So y- you just gave a, a master class right there in, in sales leadership. So I really appreciate that. Sounds exhausting, doesn't it? All of that. Um, it really does yeah well and i'll add one thing that we've talked about the whole time and i think is one of the things that we neglect we neglect community when we feel like we're getting on an island right sales sales people a lot of times neglect that and sales leaders so that's why i so appreciate your work in that and driving that community and forcing those habits to to help us not do that and to stay connected um that's so critical in driving ourselves. I, I think it's critical in any profession. Uh, but sales, when you're, it's like baseball, or you say cricket, you know, when you, when a great player is hitting 300, uh, you know, it's every three out of 10 times they're successful, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of room for downside and negative mindset and uh, having that community to keep that up is dang, I, that's critical. It's a great work on that. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's all about whether it's sales or sales leadership. It's sort of 80 20, right? 80% mindset and 20% skills. Yeah. So, how do people, last question, how do people find Mike and Indicator if they're interested in in your business and the mood report and, and talking to you in this content? Um, how should they get in, con- in connection? Pretty straightforward. Indicator.co.nz is our website and LinkedIn. Very easy to find. All right. Yeah. And for all of you, U.S. English speaking, NZ is NZ. That's just, no, it's <laughs> taken me a little while. Taking yeah, me a little yeah. while to figure that out. Uh, NZ, yeah, .co.nz. Yeah. Uh, well, wonderful. Well, I, I truly appreciate you being on here, uh, bringing a lot of knowledge and wisdom, and I'm um, so appreciative we got a chance to spend some time together. And we get to do it again sometime, hopefully. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. Really appreciate the time and enjoyed the conversation. All right. Well, with that, everybody, we will uh, sign off today from the Art and Science of Complex Sales. Keep shining bright and have an absolutely wonderful day. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Art and Science of Complex Sales. Please take a moment, like, subscribe, share this podcast on all your favorite platforms, and let's get the word out. This podcast is proud to be brought to you by Membrane.com. We are the world's top B2B sales platform. And in the world of B2B sales, with everything from prospecting to business acquisition to managing complex growth, Membrane has the right size technology for your sales team. Our latest innovation, the Coaching Cockpit, empowers your leaders, managers, and team with the information and tools they need to take their skills to the next level and to take advantage of the exponential power of effective sales coaching. With our technology and the top team of sales partners around the world, Membrane is helping to achieve our driving vision. This is, quite simply, 
elevating the sales profession. To learn more, find us at www.membrane.com. That is M-E-M-B-R-A-I-N.com or contact us via email at sales at membrane.com. Keep shining bright and have a wonderful day. Thank you.